Well, good morning, everyone. This is Mark Sianka. I want to welcome you to our UCIT Town Hall for this May 5th and appreciate everyone making time in your schedule uh, to join us as a UCIT community to, to welcome our special guest today. Uh, if um, you've just joined, um, we're using a format of Zoom that is unlike your common meeting format. And I just want to draw your attention to the bottom of the Zoom window. Um, you'll see not only um, uh, some of the usual suspects, but there is a Q&A button at the bottom. Uh, and as we progress through the day, uh, we'll be using uh, the Q&A uh, feature uh, to share your questions uh, with today's uh, panelists. Uh, so uh, just want to run through the program very quickly here uh, as we continue to gain attendees um, here in the Zoom session. Uh, if you back up a slide, Yvonne, thank you. Uh, just reviewing the, the agenda here very quickly. I uh, wanted to do a quick welcome and uh, as people continue to join, just share some fun statistics with all of you. Uh, our main guest today is uh, uh, Professor Michael Denon, and we'll do a, a brief bio of him uh, as part of that introduction. Then as, as typical with uh, our town halls, we've invited the chair of the IT Leadership Council, Vince Kellen, uh, to share some thoughts with us um, uh, and answer your questions as uh, we look at what it means to be uh, of service to UC in a time of COVID-19. We've got some time at the end for Q&A, uh, so hopefully this will be a, a very uh, enlightening and uh, uh, topically important uh, uh, town hall for all of us today. So on behalf of the UCIT community, I, I want to welcome you. Um, Yvonne, if you go to the next slide, I just wanted to share some statistics that very quickly begin to show a picture of how our uh, work experience has changed in the last couple of months. Um, I asked uh, our administrator for the UC Tech Slack workspace uh, to pull a report to say, how are we, how are we doing and, and what's going on in the period of um, uh, our new remote work experience? Uh, and this is showing a distribution of who's using Slack by domain. Uh, and you'll see distribution across all of our UC locations. And, um, pretty hefty number of messages during this one month period. If we go to the next slide, Yvonne, um, really what this, uh, what I wanted to be able to show is uh, the last two rows in this particular uh, chart that really show effectively uh, a doubling in the number of messages that were sent between February and March of 2020 as we all began the process of working remotely. So this is one of many tools that we have available uh, at our fingertips. And I know later on uh, in Vince's comments, he's going to talk about you know, what tools we pick up, what tools we drop and, and how we react to uh, the changing circumstances uh, of our work experience. Uh, but I thought it would be fun to just share these statistics with you this morning. Uh, so just that's it, just two slides. Don't wanna dwell on it too much, but did wanna make you aware of um, the numbers really helping us understand uh, how we're fundamentally changing um, the way we do our work. Um, so it gives me a, a great deal of pleasure to introduce our primary speaker today, uh, Professor Michael Denon, uh, who has been the professor of physics and astronomy at UC Irvine since 1997, and is now the vice provost for teaching and learning and the dean of the division of undergraduate education. Um, his research focuses on the dynamics of foams and modeling of ice melange in fjords. Uh, he has won numerous awards for research and teaching and is passionate about public research, I'm sorry, public outreach in the, in the area of science, including co-teaching an open course based on the AMC television program, The Walking Dead. He's appeared on numerous television programs, including Science of Spider-Man, uh, I'm sorry, Science of Superman, Spider-Man Tech, Batman Tech, Star Wars Tech, and Ancient Aliens. And you can also find Professor Denon in the YouTube series, Fascinating Fights, debating the outcome of battles between pop icons. 
Uh, in addition, Professor Denon uh, serves as an expert on the podcast, Fascinating Gadgets, Gizmos, and Gear-Based Technologies, where he explains how to make fictional technology a reality. And most recently, he's published a science outreach book on the intersection between science and faith titled Divine Science, Finding Reason at the Heart of Faith from Franciscan Media. So please join me uh, in your in-home, silent Zoom kind of way, uh, welcoming Professor Denon to our UCIT Town Hall. Thank you for joining us. Hi, hi Mark, thanks. I'm great to be here. Um, I've done this twice now, and it's one of the strangest things to basically talk to myself. Um, I, I can't see anyone um, else, so it's really going to be useful to me in this talk um, and presentation if you use the question, the Q&A function, um, which was described to you at the bottom. I have that window open. Um, at any point, go ahead and, and send me questions. Um, it's the only way I'll, I'll know there's anyone out there. Um, I'm happy to interrupt it and myself at any point and answer questions if it works there and there'll be time at the end for questions as well. So what I'm gonna do now is, is share my screen um, to get my PowerPoint up. Um, and I think we're good there. I can still see the question and answer. Okay. Um, so what, what I'm going to talk a little bit about today is using data analytics to drive student success. And I, I've organized it into three um, general categories. And, and the PowerPoint slides, I'm going to be honest right from the beginning, will have very little information in them. I'm mostly going to talk. They're there more to kind of give you something to have a framing and, and make sure I'm, I'm kind of aligned with what I want to say. But I broke it into these three um, arbitrary categories, student success planning, pedagogical technology, um, and what I'm going to call student tools. And the first one I'm going to talk about, um, probably the longest, simply because it's what I think we are most ahead on at UCI. Um, so I do want to share some of what we're doing here. Um, pedagogical technology is a really important one right now in this moment in time because the the impact of the pandemic and the the rapid switch across the uc system and across the nation to remote teaching really highlights that so i thought i'd share some thoughts and framing on it it's kind of forward looking um student tools is a, is a broad category that at uci we were just starting to transition to looking at closely um, other places um, are farther ahead um, and have done interesting things. And so that's um, one I'll, I'll probably spend the least time on, but comment on at the end. Uh, so let me move forward. So student success. Now, normally I would, you know, do the classic PowerPoint thing and, and hide all my bullet points um, to avoid people reading ahead and distracting themselves. Luckily, there's very little on this slide. So if you happen to read ahead, it won't distract you for long, I hope. And I really think when it comes to the, the broad phrase student success and how we're using data, um, I want to take a brief step back. I think there was a period where what was called predictive analytics got a lot of press. And the basic idea was we have all this data on how students used to be successful. Um, and now we're going to use it to predict um, which students are at risk and which students are likely to be successful. And then we'll help the students that are at risk. And if you look nationally, from my perspective, certainly most faculty, um, and particularly at what I would call our peer institutions, the UC level ones, where we have very high performing students to begin with, um, the classic predictive analytics doesn't really help us or, or work real well. Um, and you can understand it. We, we are very selective. Um, and in fact, the biggest predictor of success when your graduation rate is already 80% or higher is simply that you got into UCI. Um, it's very, very hard um, at the selective institutions, I would argue, to find the right type of even data to look at 
um, to do much better in a predictive sense than that the student was here. That being said, um, we can certainly use the data in lots of different ways um, to help us inform how to outreach to our students, which students outreach and what outreach to give to them. And we have much richer data than those initial predictive analytics we're working on. So I, under what data to use, I highlight the first line is CIS student information system data. That was what most initial predictive analytics were based on. This is the traditional data from a registrar, maybe from um, financial aid data, maybe from admissions data. Um, it's the demographics of the student, it's their grades, uh, it's um, other, other factors um, along different axes. And it's the data we've all had um, easy for a very long time, but it's unclear if it's really the most useful data. Um, it has some predictive power, it has some value, but what we're really wanting to ask ourselves as institutions uh, is how do we leverage other data that we're now getting? And this is part of what we're doing at UCI on a project funded by the Mellon Foundation that I'm co-PIs with, which our Dean of School of Education, Richard Arum, he's the main PI. Uh, and the, the project is actually designed along these three streams of data, the traditional CIS data, what we would call survey data. So this is really in a world of smartphones and nudging and pinging and pop-up surveys and individual questions. If you are having the ability to get information from students, how can we leverage and use it? So at the local in-class level, I, I will share that whenever I teach, I at least once a week, if not for each lecture, have an online quiz. It's worth five points. There's always six questions. Four are very, very simple questions on whatever work the students needed to do before lecture to make sure that the students have the core fundamental understanding for lecture. And I tell the students that's the one time they can do what looks like cheating. I don't care how they get the answer to the quiz. They just need the answer. But there's always a question worth one point simply for answering, which is what's causing you the most difficulty now in the class. And then there's another question that's not worth any credit, it's optional. Uh, is there something else you want to tell me about the class? And as, as an as instructor in my individual course, I, I get close to 100% participation on the surveys because they're part of the grade. It's the easiest five points they can get every week. And it gives me an amazing amount of information, particularly by asking what's causing you the most difficulty. And I can interact with the students in ways collectively uh, that are, are better. And then even at the individual level, I have some insight into students I wouldn't have otherwise. So that's within a single course. How would I, I, though I call it a quiz, it's effectively a survey. And so imagine if, you know, and whatever the, the app was at your university that every student used to do stuff, whatever that is, they randomly got pinged with um, survey questions, a single question here or there. Um, the evidence is most students will answer a single question when it shows up on their smartphone and then this data can be used to understand um, how we can better serve our students in the same way my survey data for my class can be used to better understand my class. And the challenge is how do we do that? What impact does it do? How do we best arrange these things? And these are questions the Mellon Project is studying. And we, we started in the fall and, and one of the things we did for a group of students is we, um, their sur the students fell into different categories of how often they got surveyed. But one was effectively like my um, weekly class survey, but there was a question they got asked as a survey question at the beginning of each week, which was, what are your plans for this week for studying? What are your goals? What's your basic schedule? Some other questions along those lines. And we actually saw a measurable increase in, in student performance that based on the more detailed follow-up surveys of the students actually seems to be mostly attributed to simply to the fact that they were asked a question. So even without getting the data back and using it in any way, we see surveying students in this quiz mode, which you might call nudging software, but nudges tend to be specific reminders to do things. And that'll show up later in my talk. This really was just asking a student about their week and there was no requirement to actually do it. Even students who didn't actually answer the survey, the fact that they got it 
they reported it reminded them to do stuff and stay more focused. So that's a very exciting area, area in the data space. And then the big one, which I think is overwhelming to most of us, is the learning management system data. Um, and I'll come back to that in the, the transition to remote, but as we actually leverage learning management systems of various forms, we just know a lot more about both what faculty and students are doing while they teach. When are they doing things? Are they the type of student that procrastinates? Are they the type of students that do everything ahead of time? Um, and we are, again, working on, well, what are the right questions? What are the right data elements to pull out of these systems so that we can improve what we're doing? And for me, one of the biggest challenges here is how do we not become prescriptive? How do we use this to really understand the great diversity that goes on in learning? Um, one of the comments that was made as we were thinking about this, you know, you can say, oh, well, if you look at students that procrastinate, maybe those are the students at risk. Yet there are certainly students who procrastinate and do things last minute and are very successful. Um, I actually have personal experience with that as my eldest child is an amazing procrastinator um, and was very successful. And so is there the possibility of getting more nuanced with the data where we can correlate procrastination with other behaviors and variables. So we say, okay, yeah, that student tends to procrastinate, but we don't need to worry about it. Um, they're likely to still be successful. Um, whereas this other combination, um, you know, these students do tend to struggle and how do we get them help? And then this will feed to my later topic of, of what do you actually nudge the students with? And I'm very excited about work out in Michigan that we partner with them where they really are discovering the importance of nudges and advice coming from peers. And I think that was the shortfall of a lot of the predictive analytics. Um, even if you wanna just change student behavior, um, the students most often listen to their peers, not necessarily the faculty um, or, or even necessarily messages from the phone that tell them what to do. So that's my biggest interest right now is really, how do we leverage this vast amount of data to help us um, in our mission as a university um, in, in terms of what we're trying to do for student success, particularly from an inclusion and diversity point of view. We have to be very, very careful with data that we don't build into our systems the implicit biases that are showing up, I think, often in AI and other systems as people study it more. Um, so that's, that's a big challenge, which I'll mention again um, near the end. There's two other big challenges that come in. Um, one is, where do we store the data and how do we manage it? Um, this, these are very large data sets beyond what I think many campuses have, have dealt with in this space before. Um, and it's really exciting to see the different advances at uh, other campuses. Um, at UCI, we're working on our student data warehouse finally. Um, we've been doing that on and off and not with full focus for a while. And um, it's really become a formalized project now and raised its priority level. Uh, but we're looking to our sister campuses that have done various things and, and to maybe learn and learn from there as well as elsewhere around the country. And, you know, the big, I think, challenge and question in this space always comes down to how much of this do we do in house and how much do we leverage, you know, cloud solutions that exist out there um, that are third party or commercial and what are the data risks and the data benefits, um, the cost balances. And so there's a lot of really important questions there. Um, and here at UCI, it's also how do we use the data and get access to it? And we have our Compass Initiative, which is comprehensive analytics for student success um, that we've been running for three to four years now. And I mentioned a lot of it came out of this idea of trying to have predictive analytics. We had used the Student Success Collaborative. It hadn't worked very well. And, and ironically, what we found, at, at least in the early stages, the biggest impact and the lowest hanging fruit is around reporting. Uh, particularly getting information and data and dashboards in the hands of faculty. And I do want to give a shout out to my counterparts at UC Davis, who have had some really, really uh, big successes with, with um, nice dashboards around data for faculty around the courses they're teaching. We've explored a slightly different direction. A lot of our data reports um, are, are kind of 
more general that faculty can access about overall classes broadly at UCI. So right now we're set up, a faculty member can look at the data reports associated with any class, not just their own, because of the type of data we're putting in it. But both, one of the things UC Davis and we have done that's very been very powerful for student faculty is providing information on the demographics of their students and the ac average academic history. What courses on average have your class, the students in your class taken? What's been their path to your class? Um, I've learned that faculty often assume students in their class have had certain courses, even if they're not official prereqs, they're assumed to be um, the path you take to get to that particular course. Uh, and when they discover that, oh, only 30% of their students actually had that course, they realize, well, maybe I need to rethink how I'm teaching this and how I structure it. So there's a lot of power gained in just reporting information and getting data of the appropriate type in front of faculty. And then as we move forward, at least at a campus like UCI, what we've realized is given the average overall success of our students, as we look at um, sort of more the data analytics side of things and where to do the analysis, we're, we're really focusing on a much more local analysis. Um, and one of the examples I like to point out to faculty is if you look at gaps in performance and gaps in how students change majors, most faculty were aware that, you know, a lot of STEM majors leave and go to social science. Um, and often the, there's a gap there. More of our um, low income first gen underrepresented students leave STEM than the other students. And, and that people were kind of aware of. But when you actually have the ability to look at data like this, what you find is those change of major pathways are actually often quite different by, by major. Um, so for instance, if you look at chemistry versus biology, uh, in chemistry, not only is there a gap in who leaves chemistry, but there's a very different behavior in where they go when they leave chemistry. So um, our, our URM students do tend to leave for social science more than our non-UM students, but we also find that our non-UM students are almost predominantly actually leaving to biology related majors. They're not going to social science. So there's a gap in who leaves and there's a gap in where they go. Um, whereas when you look at bio, you don't see that gap in where they go because almost all students leave bio for social science. There's just a gap in the numbers. So these nuances and how our students behave are really important for us to understand what, in, you know, what institutional structures do we need to change? What other resources do we need to put into the system and where do we want to put them? So these are kind of the three main things I wanted to talk about. I'm going to briefly touch on the other two topics. Uh, there has not been any questions yet, so I'm going to assume they're all going to come at the end, but again, feel free to type one in at any point. Um, so I wanted to comment briefly on pedagogical technology. It's particularly interesting right now. Um, we've had almost, we've had every campus, you know, have this sudden switch to remote teaching um, and struggle with language like um, remote versus fully online and what happens to technology in person. And people keep asking me in my role as vice provost in teaching and learning, what's the future of all this going to look like? And I'm gonna actually work backwards through these three bullet points. I think the number one impact of a sudden shift to remote teaching for faculty has been that pretty much everybody has now been forced to use technology. And, and the reality is that when you, um, oh, Couple just you know questions came in on how are you securing data and balancing privacy? I will actually answer those in a moment. Let me just finish this thought because I think that's on my final slide, so I will come to that. Um, so we've got we've got this sudden shift shift to technology, and and what it means is faculty I think are now going to be much more comfortable with the concept that technology is a tool. Um, the conversation has usually been framed as online courses versus in-person courses, which is a, a, a dichotomy that's just too black and white. It's just too um, um, either or, or binary, 
It's not one or the other. We live in a technology world. Our students are almost essentially all work, walking around with a smartphone. The access to data now is incredible. And if we as faculty and institutions don't acknowledge the fundamental shift in students' ability to access technology, to cooperate with each other and to work remotely, um, we're doing a big disservice to our teaching. We also have to recognize um, and help people understand who are, are, are pro online. And, and just to be fair and, and transparent, I taught the first undergraduate online course at UCI that was approved by the Senate. I've taught three online courses. As you heard in my bio, I've done MOOCs. I love the online world, but online has its place and role just like being in person has its place and role. And so it's not about an either or, it's about balancing and leveraging the strengths of where they belong. And so as we move backwards out of this sudden shift to all remote, my hope and expectation is that faculty will have taken some time to think about their teaching and their classes and how the technology they now got experience with actually can enhance the in-person experience, particularly in places where it's clear in-person is necessary, um, but it can still be augmented. And so this particularly, you know, becomes relevant for the buzz phrase of active learning, which in my mind is just any um, technique you do while teaching that engages students with each other, with the material or with yourself. So these are some exciting um, things that will, will come forward. I wanted to say just a few words because it's out there um, that You've got individual course feedback. What I mean by that is students can be in a course now and get a dashboard that tells them how they're doing in certain things, um, what they might want to do differently. Um, you've got the opportunity to do planning tools. This is that scary space of the amazon.com world where students can get messages like, oh, we see that students who are interested in things like you are also do this. Would you consider doing it? Uh, that was described as the Amazon letting you know what you want to buy before you actually know you want to buy it. And it makes so much sense you go out and buy it. So that's a good thing. And then I already alluded to nudge tools, which is this idea of sending students messages around student success. And I can say a little bit more about these if people want in the questions, but I've got two questions in my Q&A space that are very relevant to some of the things I've been putting in what comes forward and what would be next. So I want to spend a little bit on the data oversight usage and privacy, which is a great question. Thank you, Robert, for asking that. Um, so securing the data. Uh, this is one of the reasons we've chosen to build a student data warehouse on our campus. Um, we had discovered that a lot of this data is living in um, shadow databases on campus and other places, all for good reasons, all because people actually needed the data um, and, and there was a legitimate reason for it, but the structures weren't necessarily in place. Um, and as far as we can tell, all the right stuff is still secure, but it's way harder to do security in that sort of environment. And by building a true data warehouse that um, it helps both with cleaning the data and making sure our data is accurate and that we're all using the same data. So when I make my statement about low income students in a talk, um, my colleagues on the campus can trust I'm using the same definition as low, of low income that they are. So when they run an analysis for their unit, we're talking about the same students. And so the, the, the student data warehouse structure will really help with the securing because it also will allow us to clean up access to the data and put in um, different levels of access control depending on the needs of the person who's using the data. Um, and the privacy side, the balancing the privacy, you know, the, the first thing that happened in this space was um, there was predictive analytics for academic advisors and many places still use these. And, and depending on your institution, as I said, it doesn't work great yet for high performing institutions, but there are many institutions out there that this has been a key part of, of having things sort of work for them. The, the first realization was, well, we really, to be frank, don't wanna do this in course rosters because there's, there's nothing 
there's a lot of danger around a faculty member getting uh, a sort of list of students that are coded, I don't know, green, yellow, and red. Green are your students that are likely to do well. Yellow are your students that are likely to do bad. And red is, um, you know, a student at risk. This has all sorts of um, challenges around how the faculty would respond and use that data. So for privacy, the, the, the nice thing about our current uses is, is they're focused on collective student data um, in ways that with 30,000 students and then even when you get to the level of a major, most majors are thousands of students, I'm, oh, or hundreds of students, sorry, if not thousands, you know, doing everything in, in sort of averages and aggregates, even when you break them down by certain slice along certain characteristics, still keeps the number of students large. So at its most basic, we anonymize the data. We don't actually release or slice along any categories that are smaller than um, 10 or 15, depending on the characteristic and the use. Um, and so for all of the institutional uses, that's a lot of, of what we're doing. There are certain things and challenges um, that we don't actually release now by course because it would be hard in that particular data question to balance the privacy of the faculty members say, because that's always, there's always less faculty than there are students associated with, with any course. Um, so those are some of the things we're doing. The other side of this is we're, we're we, have def, we have formed a student data warehouse governance group um, around the data governance to, to address and make sure these issues are being met. And that group will work within the larger campus um, data governance structure um, to make sure we're consistent with campus policies around privacy um, and access. And you know what I've heard from the privacy people and what I've heard in other areas you know, is it's important to not go to the extreme where we're, we don't let any of the data out and we never use it because someone might be able to figure out a way to do something bad with it. The, the reality is you, 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 you take care of the bad actors when it happens, unfortunately. You do everything you can to prevent it within reason um, and, you, and you do what you need to to recover from it. You're always rate, balancing risk versus what would be the impact of a particular privacy violation. Um, so for instance, on one extreme, we do absolutely nothing with social security numbers. That's, we don't even bring that into any of our data systems around student success um, because the risk would just be too great. So those are some of the things around privacy. Um, the next um, question, it was good surprises that have come out of remote learning and what causes the biggest deficit in learning online. I'm going to take those in reverse order. I think the biggest deficit in learning online is not really appreciating the, the, the need for additional structure, um, both on the student side and the faculty side, uh, because we just haven't done a lot of it right now. Um, that's the immediate biggest deficit. And what I mean by that is, I, I've shared this um, in some places, if you think about an in-person course, it automatically has the structure of when the classes meet. Um, and even if I point out, even if you're a student that skips class, you actually know when you're skipping class. There's an element in your schedule associated with the course. I am skipping class today. Um, and, and that sounds silly, but it's actually very relevant. And for online learning, it's often asynchronous or way more of it is, and it creates this challenge of structure and um, both for students and for faculty. Long-term, the biggest deficit in online learning is that as great as things are, even in the world of Zoom, um, there's research on this and it's coming out and there's more of it now. Um, a lot of these um, subtle clues in human communication aren't transmitted because you know we change the bandwidth, there's internet glitches and so on. And, and a lot of being a faculty member, when you have that opportunity to interact with students in small groups or even one-on-one -on -one, is reading the body language to understand what is, what is it that they're really confused about. So that, that's a more long-term challenge. For me, this, I, I would argue this wasn't really a surprise, I expected it, but, but the really 
good surprise I hope people appreciate and students appreciate is just how amazing the UC faculty are and how amazing the UC students are. Um, universities get harassed for not being able to be flexible. Um, and we basically chain, turn the corner in you know, a week or less for many places to remote learning. Um, and you can argue whether it's good or bad. I, I definitely say for my place, there are certainly challenges. Anytime you do something new, you, you, you're gonna by definition have challenges. But the core learning, because it's based on our faculty that are excellent and our students that are excellent, um, is still quite excellent. Very different. Um, remote looks very different than, than in person, um, but still excellent. So that was an exciting surprise for me. Um, jumping down to the question on scope of our student data, we, yes, we, um, everything I do and what we're doing is all as vice provost of teaching and learning, it's not only limited to the college students, I focus on the undergraduates. Um, now, at UCI, the School of Ed has a lot of research on online learning in all levels. Um, and I, and I'm, I know other places are doing this as well. So our faculty are looking at community college, they're looking at K through 12, um, the, whole, the whole gamut. Um, but my, day, what my focus is, is the undergrads. Um, Um, nice question on the fact that students can go back and watch videos again. And yes, that's definitely an issue we want to study, see how it impacts students. Um, one of the things I'm, I'm curious about is it can have both positive and negative effects. Students can go back um, and do this, but they also might, for instance, be tempted not to take um, notes. And for many students, the act of taking notes is a key step in the learning process to help um, organize your thoughts and so on. And that is really something that I'm, I'm curious how that will happen. Um, and let's see, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry in the question that asked the difference between an IRL versus online. I'm gonna assume that maybe that's IPL in-person learning and online. Um, I think that's a good question that we're looking to figure out. Um, the difference, and I would not qualify, I'm actually very um, picky about this. I would not talk about it in terms of the value students get out of the two courses because it's like saying, well, what's the value you, difference in the value you get out of a play versus a movie that are both kind of the best of their genre? Um, I wouldn't, it's not the value you're getting out of that, it's the experience. There's a very different experience for a movie and a play there's a lot of overlap. There's a lot of things that movies and plays as art forms um, give us that are similar, but there are definite differences. And I think that's what we have to recognize about the online versus the in-person experience is not that they're of different value, um, but there are definitely different experiences and they will serve different needs. Um, on the practical question of, do we have a student data policy document that we can share? Um, I'm gonna, I think we're, because we're actually in the middle of forming our campus-wide one, our, our student-based one is also was being under development uh, because of the, where we are in the student data warehouse. And both are in enough flux now. I wouldn't show them yet, but I would predict by certainly the end of this year, um, if the pandemic doesn't hold us up, we would, we would definitely have that. Um, the advice I have on, I'm trying to stick to my 1140. It just hit 1140, but there's two more questions. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so that I, I, I cede control. I'll ask the last two, answer the last two questions quickly and then turn it over. I think Vince is next. Um, Zoom fatigue, the best advice I heard actually came from our esports um, colleagues around the world. Um, the 2020-20 the rule, which is after 20 minutes of looking at a screen, you need to look away for 20 seconds, at least 20 feet in the distance. Apparently that's how people who are playing video games stay focused. Um, now, I, 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 there's lots of other things. And, and I think for me, it's just Diet Coke, which is probably not a real good solution. And the final one, what social intelligence would have to change for the staff and faculty? I don't know if it's really a social intelligence thing, but I think we have to stop thinking of online and data and technology as something different 
and recognize that it's completely integrated into what we have now um, in our life. And it's a tool that's there. And it's sort of like when, when someone invented the printing press, there was a lot of social unrest around books. People were worried about books. They were going to cause all sorts of downfalls. But when it was finally embraced as a technology, I think most people would agree it was a net benefit. Um, and I think we're going to see the same thing. I, I do believe that in recent, very recent time, just the nature of the internet and the smartphone has actually changed um, data in a fundamental way that the printing press did that a lot of other steps, people thought they had changed it, but really hadn't. So I think that would be my closing thought. Um, thank you all. Um, I'll turn it back over. And the, if you think of any questions, um, I think there'll be some time at the end to answer some more. And I'm happy. Um, my email is easy, mdenon at uci.edu. Feel free to reach out to me. So thank you very much. OK, thank you, Michael. Appreciate the time. Vince, you ready to go? There we go. Yep, just a minute here. All right. Everybody Great can session. see the thank screen. You. Thank you, Professor Denon. It was a spectacular set of comments. Great. You're welcome. Um, thank you for having me. What I'm going to do here is as a CIO here and chair of the HLC is sort of um, share with you kind of a broader perspective on where we are at this point in time and what we can expect and probably a little bit more of a personal perspective as well. Uh, and certainly with, with COVID, uh, earlier I was saying, uh, you know, uh, COVID all the time. Now I've been saying COVID forever. Uh, not, not that I want it forever at all, but it, it sort of seems like it. I think a lot of us are kind of staring into the abyss of going, what is the future going to bring? And certainly at our campuses, at the executive leadership level, there's all sorts of planning going on to try to get a handle at that. And so from, from one standpoint, I think we're uh, further ahead in understanding the virus and our response to it than perhaps the economic repercussions. But that said, something like this has really not happened in our lifetime. Some are arguing it really hasn't happened in 100 years. But in this particular case, we have a global synchronous pandemic with a global synchronous economic meltdown and impact. And that is a first. So if anybody thinks they know how this is going to go, uh, it's probably not correct. So there is confusion even among the experts, uh, but everybody is working hard to try to understand it. I think the great thing about being at UC here is we've got some of the best scientists and healthcare experts in the world here. So our campuses are using this great talent to help uh, guide our decisions. And so having fact-based and empirical decision-making that's really tightly in tune to the science is fantastic and it's a great benefit to UC. From my standpoint, having been in higher ed now, a good chunk of my professional life, and before that in the area of strategy consulting, um, I can say that UC is a very strong system. We're gonna come out of this probably stronger than, than many of our universities that, uh, across the country and the world. And so I'm not so much worried about the long term. I think demand uh, for education in UC has not dropped, or at least we haven't seen it yet uh, in our case. And we certainly know the long-term demographics both in California and how that deviates from the nation. Uh, but we see that as being strong and, of course, demand for health care while having to have been slowed down now deliberately for the pandemic that is going to continue on into the future. I think research, while it's slowed a bit, uh, continues and, and you see as a powerhouse of research uh, with uh, several of our institutions in the top uh, 20 uh, research uh, group. So I think that we're very positioned well for the future. So from, a, from that standpoint, from the strength of the institutions for building in the future, I'm not worried. Now, the short-term loss of revenue to our institutions is certainly critical. And that's been happening first and foremost in healthcare, but not limited there. All of us have housing and dining and educational missions and auxiliaries that uh, have a big impact on uh, our financial uh, immediate short-term here. This is going to require difficult decisions and adroit leadership to manage uh, over the next uh, months and actually the next couple of years. And of course, all of us are watching carefully how the state budgets and legislators will respond later in the year. 
Uh, it will take some time for the economic outlooks to come in uh, to reality and, and, and how that will uh, constrain our budgets for the future. But again, while we can be very worried about it, rest assured, Having been in other states, uh, we are all entering this uh, this world together as a nation across all of higher education. And so it isn't so much what's going to be happening here, but how well can we can react and use our strengths to walk through this. And I think the, the good news is uh, all of our institutions are looking at the right mix of public health approaches and, and medical approaches to restoring our activity on campuses for whatever the duration we need and whatever approach we need to take. I think those time frames are still evolving, um, but from where I'm at, certainly in our universe, I'm very happy with how we are piecing our way through it. The next question uh, is really about what should IT do in this? In, in some regards, you could say that despite the horrific impact of this pandemic, in a way it's making possible in just a month or two that which might have taken 20 years to accomplish. And I will echo Michael's comment that the academy at UC has responded remarkably well on literally flipping the switch on instruction. And for all of us who deal with enterprise systems and the business administrator and business process change and all of the uh, issues, objections, and concerns we have, I am humbled by the faculty who have done this. Now, I've been an instructor for many years uh, in higher education, mainly at the master's level, graduate level, and upper uh, undergraduate levels. Um, so I know firsthand what's involved in uh, teaching and making the shift. And so kudos to the academy here for doing that. And I agree. I think uh, the thing that may come out of this is more faculty will come at this utilizing technology to enhance the teaching they do in the, in the, with the students, have students learn deeper and better than before and hopefully even help the faculty reduce their workload as they can uh, continue to address what they have to do. So I think this notion of new ways of doing business is a big part of what we need to do right now. Uh, this is a once in a 100 year event that requires once in 100 year thinking, incrementally approaching what we're about to step through based on frames from yesterday are probably not gonna be sufficient. And so I think creative thinking uh, around new ways of doing business across any dimension you could put that is in order. And it is certainly what our stakeholders, taxpayers, and citizens across the nation desperately want from higher education, is they want higher education to think of new ways of doing business. We have an opportunity in IT to make that difference. I think this notion of, even though I, I sort of critique uh, incrementality in terms of mental frames, in terms of how you go about implementing radical change or even modest change, using continuous improvement approaches uh, is very important. So certainly at UC San Diego, we've been adopting Lean Six Sigma in a big way. But I think this notion of incrementality and improving continuously over and over and over is where IT can help right now. One does not learn a new skill all in one fell swoop, certainly not in teaching and certainly not in systems. It's really a progression of a series of little skills uh, that are accumulated over time. And IT can do its part to lead the way in this notion of how to do uh, incremental learning and improving. Uh, I think obviously we've done a big switch right here, both in remote working and remote learning uh, in order to help our institutions, but we can continue to lead the way on how uh, digitization and digital technologies will actually help and accomplish what we need to do, certainly in the next few months, but also the next few years. IT people sometimes are the absolute most resistant to tool change. While in fact, we work with users that we try to get them to adapt to new cha change and we have all these change management programs and, and, and process analysis, all this work that we do. And sometimes the IT worker complains about those business people who don't adapt to change. When you ask an IT person to change, it's often met with even a more uh, difficult response than the business person. And so I remind, certainly in my unit, our IT people, that IT people are, we're professionals, and at a certain level of mastery, you learn to drop your tools. You learn to look at the tool differently, not as something that's attached to you and your identity, 
which ironically in the early stages of skill development in IT, that's a very important part. When the individual gains an identity with a vendor, with a particular tool set, with a particular language, with a particular networking approach, they tend to study it deeply, uh, get more involved with it, and achieve certifications and mastery over it. I'll call that the apprentice to journeyman uh, stage. To get to the mastery stage requires the sort of letting go of all of that. Uh, and for those of us who've been it a long time, uh, we've either been burned by our most cherished vendor, or even, war or even better still, burned by our most cherished prior versions of ourselves, where we have created a solution only to have it come back and haunt us like Frankenstein's monster years later, uh, where we suddenly realized that, oh my gosh, the way we did it was probably not the best way. So all of us have to be prepared to drop our tools. In times of change, especially discontinuous change like this, we may need a lot of that in order to get our way uh, through the next bit of time. So I always remind the IT people, be a master, be prepared to drop your tool, have a pirate-like attachment to them, meaning you know, you're going to drop them at the first sign of trouble or the first sign that there's another better approach out there. Or another way to think of it is think very creatively and broadly about the different tools we have, creative and broadly and almost irreverently about different combinations uh, that may work that others hadn't thought of. And I think the last thing that I want to leave you with on what we can what IT can do about this is this notion of working together. We don't spend a lot of time in IT deeply diagnosing, decomposing, or analyzing what makes for a great team. The good news is there's a fair bit of research on that. And one could read what do the social science researchers say about this. And within IT, we know it certainly in our units that we have between group rivalries, uh, where we've got different IT groups that do similar, if not overlapping or identical things that create rivalry. Within organizations, rivalries are expensive to maintain. I certainly believe the market is the place where rivalries exist. And so if you want to have rivalries, do it in a market sense where there's a lot of degrees of freedom for all the parties to engage in that rivalry. But when you get inside an organization, between group rivalries are expensive to maintain. They carry a cost with them. Conversely, when you actually start to collaborate with another unit, most people quickly discern the difference between authentic collaboration and kind of forced collaboration. So when we experience authentic collaboration, we know it. And it is the stuff of our IT work. We thrive off of authentic collaboration. Sometimes hard to get there, but we thrive off of it. And so I think trying to figure out how to get to authentic collaboration and how to get to the level of teamwork where you're now operating at an expert level. And one of the signs I have that a team is expert is the members of the teams, plural, can correct each other well and still work together well. In much the same way, if a shortstop in a softball field or baseball field has a hard time getting to third base, the third baseman is good for the third baseman to know that, it's good for the shortstop to know that, and it's good for the two of them to talk about it. So the two of them can make the double play when two experts who are fighting over who's going to cover that ball watch the ball go between them. So teams that are able to correct and improve each other work well. So the word I use with my team is, what are you doing to improve your peer team? You're coming to me with a complaint about your team, but I'm asking you, how are you improving them? And so the work that we have to do to continually improve our peer teams uh, is a part of what will enable IT to work better in an organization. IT is just not simply a tool we buy and we implement. IT is a tool we intertwine with the cultural, political, and process fabric of the university. And if that intertwining process is done well, it's a very strong uh, bond that does improve productivity and enables the institution to do more work. Finally, I want to leave with what should you do in all of this. Um, for, I want to acknowledge for everybody here that times like these are absolutely stressful. Uh, and we know some of us have been through this a couple of times. I know from my own personal experience, the 2008 timeframe was particularly stressful on myself and my family. And so I want to acknowledge that and, and, and recognize to people that it's actually a good sign. You're attending to the signal in the environment is painful, 
mentally, emotionally, it may be for you and your family. And family is important. So please utilize everything that UC system can provide you to help you and your family and, and certainly do that. A part of that equation is you as the IT worker. Uh, during this time and for the future, we need the best version of yourself. So invest in yourself, maintain a balanced and positive mindset. Uh, I've been doing this to myself. I've been a Zoom jockey. I get on a Zoom horse at seven in the morning and I get off my Zoom horse seven, eight o'clock at night. It's not a great ride. Uh, so I'm forcing myself to get up and get out and maintain the balance uh, uh, even as we go through this. Since we're now stepping into the post-COVID response phase, into now the sustainable operations phase of this, uh, maintaining a positive mindset is important. Uh, as I said earlier, I think this is a big transition that we've all been waiting for. I think this is a fantastic opportunity to uh, work with digital technology in new ways. In many ways, this is an historic opportunity. In fact, this is your time, our time, to really make a difference. Uh, longer term, I'm not worried about the IT profession. As you can see, digitization is alive and well, and it's now powering. Things that were kind of a little more towards the periphery of our existence are now front and center to running university, Zoom, uh, 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 Canvas LMS, and, and all of the tools we use to work and teach remotely are now front and center uh, to things. And so the, the IT worker, uh, if, if any of us are worth their salt, we're going to be fine, and our careers will be fine. Uh, but now how do we keep our balance and continue to uh, learn new things and make ourselves valuable to our organizations? And lastly, I'm going to leave with a simple thought. Uh, in times like this that are very uncertain, we have two very important assets, and they are each other and an unwritten future, because between the two of those, anything is possible. And I'm going to stop my screen share here, turn it back to you, Mark. Thank you, Vince. Um... I appreciate the thought that went into those um, three slides of looking at, um, it, it's kind of a glass half full observation of where we are. And I think um, times like this create the best opportunities that we as IT professionals will ever face. So I appreciate the way you structured those comments and um, they provide a good um, uh, companion to um, Michael's earlier comments in the day. I just want to, um, yeah, and as someone just said in uh, the Q&A section, the glass is always refillable, too. Uh, so not, all, not only is it half full, it's refillable. And I think yeah. um, that's the yeah. that we're talking about here. Yeah, and part of the coping is, that's necessary is to find the opportunity. Because at any given point in time, despite the up or down trends of the world around us, we live in a land of relative opportunity, uh, uh, taking advantage of opportunities. So if UC system is really good at taking advantage of opportunities, one, we're, we feel good about it while we're doing it, and two, we're going to come out of this better than others. So to me, I can, you know, wallow in my misery, which sometimes I do over a few drinks, but uh, it's far better to get down and start contributing and figuring out what we can uh, make a difference with. Great. So let's, let's make that the uh, closing comment for the day. I want to acknowledge we're at time. Uh, I want to thank everyone for making time in your day to join us. Um, I think the UCIT community is stronger when we come together like this. So thanks to everyone uh, for your time and attention today. And we'll do another one of these soon. As, uh, as our circumstances evolve and as we know more about uh, what the next six months might look like, uh, we'll bring a topically specific presentation forward. So thank you everyone for your time today and, and have a great one.